thanks for coming. As you heard, this is most of the project samples that you're going to see are geared towards elementary. But basically the goal of this is to get you thinking a little bit differently about the way that we structure our assignments, whether you're elementary or secondary. It's basically talking about how to move your kids into that upper echelon of Bloom's taxonomy. So um, a lot of times when kids copy, people automatically put all of the onus on the students. But as the educators, we own a part of the reason why our students are copying. We can't put it all on them. A lot of times, the assignments that we give our kids just encourage them to copy and data dump. We might say, write a report on Rosa Parks. We're not really asking them to use the information. All we're asking them to do is find information. And when you're just asking them to find the information, it makes it really easy for them to go to the internet, highlight, copy and paste, put it on the page, and not even know if what they're putting on that page is relevant or even relates to the assignment that you're asking them to do. Basically what we need to do is we need to introduce the research process and teach our kids how to research. One of the basic components of research, starting at the very bottom, is making sure our kids understand the assignment. I work in the media center and a lot of times I have kids come in and say, I need a book on dogs. Okay, are you reading for pleasure? Is this for a report? It's for a report. Okay, well, what do you have to know in your report? I don't know. I just have to do a report on dogs. So right from the get-go, we're setting our kids up for failure. One of the easiest ways to know if your kids understand what you're asking them to do is to have them repeat the assignment back to them, back to you. If they can do that, you know that they've got it. If they can take what you've given them, put it in their own words, and tell you what you're asking them to do, you know that they're starting off on the right foot. And what we want to do is we want to get them to that upper level. We want to have them create something. We want to have them synthesize something. Matching, locating, all of those things are great foundational skills. But what we really need to do is we need to push our kids into that upper level. Once you get them up there, and once you have them engaging a material, engaging a source, they're more likely to remember what you're doing. Someone shared yesterday, rarely have I ever had a a student email me and say, wow, I really remember that test you gave us, and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. I really remember all the solar system stuff we learned for that test. But if you have them do a clay animation or an animation, they're going to say, you know what, I really remember that animation we did. And I remember when I had to move the guy from Mercury to Venus and talk about X, Y, and Z, because they really spent time engaging the material. They retain it better. As teachers, we're charged with doing a lot of stuff. We have to cram a lot of stuff into that day. And it seems like a lot of these projects may take longer than just giving that test and just doing those worksheets. But we're not asking you to do something additional. We're just asking you to take what you already do and do it a little bit differently. When you do it this way, the chances that you'll have to go back and remediate are far less likely. When they're doing those worksheets and taking those objective tests, they're not going to retain. You're going to have to go back and you're going to have to remediate. You know that as educators, everything builds from kindergarten to first to second. If they engage, they retain. So you don't have to waste the time to go back and remediate. So we own a bit of why these students are copying. But they also own it. And very rarely is it because they're lazy. That's rarely one of the reasons students copy. They might have a limited reading ability. They'll skim the text. They'll see a keyword and they'll clue one on it. And then that's when they hope and pray that everything we've taught them about context clues holds true. They figure, they see habitat, so they know that, gosh, it's, it's got to work. If context clues hold true, habitat and the stuff around it must fit. So they copy it, they paste it, they dump it. Limited vocabulary, lack of research skills. They may not know that the internet is not the only source for research. They may not see asking grandma or grandpa as research. That's one of the best forms of research. They may not consider a radio show as research, a television show as research. One of the lost arts as a media specialist that I see is using the encyclopedia, using the dictionary, consulting the thesaurus. Those are all things that are a form of research. Are they things that we need to use all the time? Absolutely not, but our kids need to have those foundational skills so that when they are reading on the internet and they come across a word they don't know, they go to the dictionary and they look it up. So if we can help them become better researchers in general, 
they're going to be less likely to copy. Lack of understanding of the assignment. If they don't get it from the very beginning, forget about it. It's over. They're not going to be able to succeed if they don't understand the core principle of what you're asking them to do. Lack of motivation. Let's face it, no one is motivated to write a three-page essay on Christopher Columbus. If you give them some ownership and you say, look, here are all of the things you can do, just like you have been doing all day today and all day yesterday. You've seen frames, you've seen pixie, you've seen twist, movie maker. All of those things, you're giving them something that's relevant to them. Those are things that they see in their life every day. Those are things that are relevant to them. Their iPod, their television, their video game. Those mean something to them. They'll be motivated to make something similar to something that's relevant in their life. And the same goes along with a non-stimulating final product. Right now, a lot of our kids are at that bottom level, locate, match, and that's what a lot of our standardized tests are asking these kids to do. We need to move them into the upper echelon of blooms to where they're creating, where they're engaging. They'll retain information so much better. Well, now research is so much saying that, you know, they don't need to have a firm grasp on all this stuff before they can start creating. I'm a firm believer in that they don't need to have a grasp on everything down in that lower level of blooms because you've seen today just once you've started to create things become a little more clear once you're hands-on once you're engaging things start to kind of turn on the light bulb starts to turn on all of the things that Lindy was talking about yesterday in terms of Marzano summarizing and note-taking pulling out the important things comparing and contrasting non-linguistic representation having them draw a picture to show understanding not all of our kids learn the same way. And you would think that your at-risk kids are the kids who are kind of stuck in that bottom tier of blooms. But really, what I've seen is those at-risk kids are the kids who soar to the top level of blooms. These are the kids who have that dexterity, who sit at home and play the video games. These are the kids who are engaged in the TV. These are the kids who really have that creativity, who are really, really excited to do those things and move to the higher level of blooms and you find with some of your gifted kids they're so type A and they're so organized those are the kids that have a hard time getting up to that upper level of blooms not your at-risk kids all of your kids are capable of getting there and sometimes it's the kids who you think aren't capable of getting there get there the fastest and succeed the best traditional assignment your topics famous african-americans make a brochure on an african-american of your choice you're not asking the kids to do anything with the information. You're asking them to find it. Once they find it, they can go ahead and copy and paste it and just dump it on the page. You're asking them to remember and you're asking them to locate. But instead, maybe try something like having them do an associative letter report where they get a letter, maybe their letter is B and they have to describe Rosa Parks using only the letter B. The next set of slides is just going to take you through some creative ways that you can structure research assignments. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll drop a PDF copy of this on the, on the shared drive so that when you go back to your classroom, you're more than welcome to print up the PDF of this and take these templates and use them in your classroom. Use them to structure your assignments. Use them to do new things. This is the Associative Letter Report. Um, basically, the way this works is it works for a person, a place, a thing. They get a topic, and for example, this student's topic was Rosa Parks. What I have my kids do is I have them draw a letter out of a hat. If you get Z, guess what? You're stuck with Z. Problem solving. You're going to have to consult the dictionary. You're going to have to consult the thesaurus. Problem solving skills are something I see that my kids lack so much. Ms. Allen, my pencil's broken. Okay, well, how can you fix it? And they think and they think, go to the sharpener. Problem solving skills is something they're really lacking because we spoon feed so much to them because of the amount of time that we have. It's easier just to say, here, let me do it. Let me get you through it and let me get you past it. And a lot of times, does that work for us? Totally. Does it work for them? No. We're not teaching them anything. We're actually doing them a disservice. So B is for Rosa Parks. Bus, bandwagon, beauty, brave, badge of honor, backbone. For one of your at-risk kids, this might be all they can do. But if you have one of those gifted kids, they take that word, bus, and they expound on it a little bit more. Why is bus relevant to Rosa Parks? So they're doing the non-linguistic representation by illustrating the bus, and then they're giving you a little bit of text. This is one of my favorite reports. It's called an if-but report. 
And this is kind of modeled after the Marzano strategies. It asks students to compare and contrast two different people, places, things, animals, anything. This is really easy to differentiate. This is done by a fifth grader, and this is an Explorer report. If I was Vasco da Gama, I would have been born in 1460 and died in 1524. Also, I'd be a Portuguese explorer who discovered a route from Portugal to the east. I would have started heading east on July 8, 1497 and reached the Cape of Good Hope on November 22nd. I would have returned in 1499 without a lot of my crew members because they died of scurvy. But I wouldn't be a Spanish explorer who first discovered Florida. I also wouldn't have established the oldest European settlement in Puerto Rico. I wouldn't be searching for the Fountain of Youth either, because then I would be Ponce de Leon. <laughs> so they're learning about two explorers. They're giving you everything you're asking them to give you, everything your curriculum requires you to get. But you're giving them the opportunity to be a little bit creative. They're writing in first person. Great teachable moment to teach about point of view. They won't be able to go to the internet and highlight and copy and paste that. They won't find that. It forces them to think critically, put things in first person, compare and contrast easy to differentiate. Your at-risk kid may only be able to give you one or two facts on each, and that's okay. The goal is to have them give you what they can give you and show comprehension the best way that they know how. This was done by a second grader. If I was an alligator, I would eat meat and live in fresh water. I would also use my tail and my feet to help me swim. Also, I'd have a U-shaped jaw, but I wouldn't have a V-shaped jaw because crocodiles have that. So we have a lot of ESL students. For them, they can show comprehension just by illustrating. I don't need all that text. I need to know that you understand the curricular topic that I'm trying to cover. So if you can show it to me in an illustration, more power to you. This is the same concept just in a state report. Lindy talked about how we do a state report, the state flower, the state bird, the state symbol. Just another take, comparing and contrasting two different states. They illustrated what they could, and then they used text for the rest. This is an if report. It's like a cause and effect report. If it didn't have eight arms, if it didn't have blue blood, if it didn't squirt black ink in the water to protect itself, it wouldn't be an octopus. So again, an animal report. And how cool is it for you as a teacher to instead of sitting there reading the same animal report over and over and over again, to see something that looks a little bit different. The cool thing about all of these projects that I'm showing you is that they can all be done with pencil and paper. You don't need to have 35 licenses of Pixie in your lab to do any of these projects. Would it be great? Totally. Is that at all of your fingertips? Absolutely not. So all of these assignments, while they look cool in Pixie, they also look just as cool on a piece of paper with some crayons. And there's a lot to be said for a hand-drawn thing put on a parent's refrigerator. So this is just a cause and effect and a different take on an animal report. This could be about an event in the Civil War. If this didn't happen, if this didn't happen, if this battle didn't happen, it wouldn't be the Civil War. It lends itself to basically any curricular area. This is a geography riddle. And this was done using frames, and some of you probably saw that chroma key tool yesterday where you just filter out the background. This is Eric, and Eric has been thrilled to know that he's traveled all around lately. Eric's been to DC, he's been to Michigan, and now he's here. In Hillsboro. So let's go to faraway places and see the Earth's changing faces. The world's smallest continent, the world's largest island, the only place that's a country, a continent, and an island. Do we know where we are yet? Australia. Australia. So he goes through and he describes qualities about Australia, never giving away that he's in Australia. So this is something that we use where Eric would stand up in front of the class, and this may be after a unit of study. And then the kids have an opportunity to guess where Eric is. Kind of like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Where in the world is Eric? So, and they get a kick out of seeing themselves in what they're doing. Mr. Report, similar to the geography riddle, students describe a person, a place, or a thing, and then the other students in the class have an option or an opportunity to guess where the student is, who the student is. I died on August 16th, 1948. Any ideas? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. Good. So ideally, the student who did this report stands in front of the class. And I would go up to Sharon, and Sharon would draw a number out of the bag, and she would pick number three. 
I would read, I hit 74 homers. If Sharon doesn't know, I move on to Laura. Laura picks number four. And we go on until they're able to guess who it is. The neat thing about this, for your reluctant students, it's kind of cool because for once, they're the only kid that knows the answer to the question. And that's a real confidence booster for these kids. Because Sharon may be the gifted student who always knows all the answers to everything. And here I am, never really willing to participate in class, but now I'm the one that knows the answer, and Sharon might not know it. So to an at-risk kid who doesn't usually participate, that's a really neat thing. And this was just drawn in Pixie. They're still doing all the research, all of the relevant things. Everything's in first person. Another way to teach point of view. Can do it with a mystery place. This one's kind of a giveaway, just by the pictures. You know that we are where? Hawaii. Hawaii. This is one of my favorite assignments. It's called the Fact or Fiction book. And this really requires kids to think critically. Um, on one side of the page, kids ask a question. Fact or fiction? Martin Luther King Jr. had seven brothers and sisters. You turn the page and it answers the question. My election fact or fiction book by Jess. Fact or fiction? John McCain agrees with universal health care. Fiction. John McCain does not believe in universal health care. Fact or fiction? John McCain wants to cut back on wasteful government spending. Fact. It is a fact John McCain does want to cut back on government spending. He wants to freeze all spending except in military. So they really did some research. They really dug deep to get a lot of these facts. So on the left side, they're answering the question from the previous page. On the right side, they're making a statement asking if it's fact or fiction. Again, non-linguistic representation just with the pictures. And this could, again, be done on anything. Space, an animal, a person, a place, an event. And it can be differentiated. Sharon might do 27 pages. Jessica might do four, and that might be great for Jessica. Super easy to differentiate. Tell me again. Are any of you familiar with the Jamie Lee Curtis book, Tell Me Again, about the night I was born? It's basically a book that tells the story of the life of a child. And this can be used as an autobiography project, as a biography project. Basically what it does is it says, tell me again about the night I was born. Tell me how I was born on March 19th, 1978, in Gross Point, Michigan, at St. John's Hospital. So they can use this as an autobiography or as a biography, and they can write it from the first person. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. And this is an example from a fifth grader named Sarah. Tell me again about how you hurried to the hospital and I was born at 2 o'clock 01 a.m. Tell me again how Daddy cut my umbilical cord and tell me again how I was born at St. Joe's Hospital. Tell me again how I was skinny and tall and tell me again how you were very excited. I don't know what this is. Tell this me picture. again how some moms go into labor but you were induced. Tell me again how you were so happy Drew could have a sister. Tell me again how the whole family came and how they brought gifts and tell me again how you this one Maybe where it's turned, in the book, they turn the important event in the life. So this was her most important event. This is my favorite. Tell me again how I lost my papa and my belly and my kitty. And tell me again how you wanted to name me Megan or Elizabeth and you wanted to name me Dumpshark Elmo. So this is a cute way to do an autobiography or even to do a biography of another person. As a teacher, this is way cooler to look at than the traditional autobiography or biography report. And what a neat thing to send home with a student at the end of the year. This is called a never ever report. Um, again, these can almost all be used cross-curricular. Never ever. You should never ever ask an emperor penguin to live in Florida because an emperor penguin 
needs to live in a pack of ice in Antarctica. And you should definitely never ever have a swim off against an emperor penguin because penguins spend most of their life in the water and swim really well. But you can definitely get advice on how to be a good dad from an emperor penguin because the dad takes care of baby penguins. So in the beginning, they talk about all the things you should never, ever do relating to an animal, a person, a place, a thing. And then they kind of wrap it up with one thing that you definitely should do as it relates to the animal, person, place, or thing that they're describing. This is an attribute report. And this can be done as young as kindergarten. The project that you're going to see was done as a buddy project between kindergartners and fifth graders. The kindergartners relayed the message and what they had learned and the fifth graders did the typing for them. I'm a T-Rex, come to my home in the forest long ago. I am a T-Rex, hear roar and crush the bones of my prey. I am T-Rex, see my 40 foot long seven ton body, see my short arms and two clawed fingers, see my 60 teeth. I am T-Rex, watch me eat a triceratops. I am T-Rex, hear me, see me, but watch out, I'm watching you. So again, just another way to teach point of view. Point of view is one of those things that's really hard to teach in the context of nothing. Teaching about first person, second person, third person. But when you put it in context of something, it makes it easier for them to understand. For rent, this is where kids try and sell something that's not really all that appealing. For rent, one spider. It's the most helpful thing you'll ever rent since it can help farmers grow cotton crops by killing other insects. Kill mosquitoes and make beautiful webs out of silk, stronger than steel. And the greatest thing about it is it only lives for one year. Unless you rent a tarantula, it lives for 15 years. So there they're taking something that's not traditionally appealing and trying to make it appealing. Again, as a teacher, it gives you just a different way for your kids to show comprehension. It gives you something different to look at other than that traditional animal report over and over again. The neat thing about this is that you can walk around the room right away and see who gets it. You can know automatically who understands the assignment and you can know then where you need to remediate. And that's an invaluable tool to be able to see right away where you need to remediate because then you can take that student and you can go back while it's still fresh in their minds and give them the help they need to bring them up to speed to where the rest of the kids are. Five senses poem. We start teaching five senses as young as pre-K. So this is something pre-K all the way through across the board that the students can do. Again, this was another buddy project between kindergarten and fifth grade. Rainforest. A rainforest is in many bright colors. It looks like four different layers of life. It sounds a chorus of animals. It smells like fresh rain. It tastes like a wild raspberry. It makes me feel like I'm in paradise. So the collaboration there is that the kindergartners relayed what they knew about rainforest and the fifth graders helped them type. And then together, they drew the picture. That's a great learning experience when you're able to collaborate with older grades and younger grades. It really lets you know that the older students understand what you've taught them. Because when you can break it down and teach it to someone else, you know they get it. As teachers, that's sometimes one of the hardest things. You know what you want to say. You know what you want to do. You know how to make that fraction. You know how to add and divide and multiply. But it's hard to explain. When your kids are able to explain a concept that you've taught them, you know that you've done an awesome job because they get it well enough to explain it to someone else. Top 10. Basically what they do is they pick the top 10 reasons to want to do something or to not want to do something. I like this because you get a little bit of who they are. Top 10 reasons to want to live in the southern colonies. The main motivation of the southern colonists is to make money. Girls don't receive schooling, so boys have a chance to be smarter, for once. <laughs> there are some big mansions in the southern colonies. You can kind of get a little picture of who Ashley is. Money, big mansions, <laughs> and boys get to be smarter than girls for once. So here they just go ahead and they pick the top ten things, and this is where you're asking them to do those Marzano strategies of summarizing, pulling out the important information, <coughs> taking what's really the most important. And then um, the last one I want to show you is just how you can use graphic novels or comics in your classroom. I find that a lot of my reluctant kids, my reluctant learners, are more apt to really participate in comic creation. Those are the kids that are totally into those graphic novels. And when they have the opportunity to show you that they understand something in a medium that's familiar to them, 
they soar. They're more likely to succeed because it's something that's relevant to them. The text is kind of hard to read, but basically this was done on core democratic values. And the one duck says, I sure do love our bubble bath in the river. And the other duck says, me too. The frog, how rude. Hey, we need to drink this water and it's polluted with all of those bubbles. Isn't this against the law? We need help. So the policeman comes along and says, ducks, I know taking a bubble bath in the water makes you happy. Even though you have the right to be happy, you can't do it if it hurts someone else. And the soapy water is dangerous for the other animals who have to drink it. You can't put soap in the water again. A solution that works for the common good. So here they were talking about pursuit of happiness versus common good. And then there are just some resources at the end. A lot of times what I'll do is once I've gone through and explained some of these assignments throughout the beginning periods of the year, once we reach the end of the year, I give the kids these formats and I say, here, show me that you understand the curricular content the best way that you know how. If that means an animation to you, great. If that means a graphic novel, awesome. I just need to know that you get it. It doesn't matter to me how they show me they get it. What matters to me is that they get it. And so a lot of these projects have them engaged in the material and spending time. They're more likely to retain stuff this way and it's not as easy for them to head out to the internet and copy and paste.